All righty. Welcome to the talk that will tell you not to trust anything and be paranoid. Uh, so we're going to talk. Uh, so before I start, yes, uh, this is, talk is not security advice. Uh, so in any situation, nothing is 100% secure. Always do your own research and consider the trade-offs and how much risk tolerance you have uh, in any particular situation. So let's talk about untrusted code. And we're going to see a few hands from the audience. Let's say you have a problem that you want to solve. And you go to GitHub. You find someone who's made an open source project that's similar to the problem that you're trying to solve. Uh, what do you do? You clone the project. Uh, and then you read the readme. And it says, OK, install these dependencies. Who just installs 200 dependencies from like unknown sources? Yep, yep, so do I. Who will carefully go through all 200 dependencies to make sure that they're legit? Yeah, oh, there's, there's a few hands, that's good. Who runs this kind of code from strangers on the internet in some kind of sandbox, like a container or a VM or something? Oh yeah, a few hands, doing good. Most of us don't. Um, but this is kind of, I, I really liked uh, Radia's trusted versus trustworthy. We tend to trust a lot of code, whether it's trustworthy or not, I'm not going to go into, I'm not going to judge. Uh, this talk is going to focus not so much on the code that we trust, but the situations where we're running untrusted code that we really, really can't trust. Right? The sort of situation where you have a website, and the website says, upload your code here, I will run it for you. Uh, and it's a big sign saying, please try to hack me. Um, that kind of situation where you're allowing users or strangers from the internet to upload code to your servers and running them as part of your product. Uh, now, the typical example of this would be some kind of cloud hosting provider. So who here works at a cloud hosting provider of some kind, your AWS's? Yeah, yeah there's, there's, there's a couple of hands. Most of us don't. Who here works at some kind of web app or some kind of like the web? There is a web page as part of your product. The product does something else. That's, more, that's a more relevant example for most of us. It was a more relevant example for me. So we're going to use that kind of example. Imagine you're working at Shopify. right? It is, it is a web app. It's not really a cloud hosting provider. Uh, Shopify stores cover a lot of the online stores uh, on the internet. If you, if you buy things regularly online, you've probably bought through a Shopify store. And one of the things that makes Shopify really powerful, I don't work at Shopify, by the way. Um, one of the things that makes Shopify powerful is its third-party app integrations. The Shopify developers don't need to develop features to cover every possible use case of every online store, because online store owners can install third-party apps that then integrate into Shopify and add extra functionality. Okay, now, this is pretty cool. Uh, a lot of web apps will, at some point, have some kind of plugin system or an API that people can use. And Shopify is no different. So the way that this works is, the developer of the third-party app runs their own web servers. These can talk to Shopify servers via a REST API or a GraphQL API. Shopify has both. Uh, and in cases where they need to get information from Shopify when something happens, they can register a webhook. And when something happens, maybe a customer checks out or something happens uh, in the process of ordering or like delivering products, then uh, Shopify servers will call, make, send requests to the third-party app's web server. Now, this is pretty standard. But this has some potential issues. Um, if you were to try to put these third-party apps in some kind of critical flow, if the third-party app wants to integrate into the checkout process itself, then suddenly, you, if it's just kind of not part of the critical path, and if the request to that third-party app fails, and it's OK, that's all right. You can probably do that. But let's say the customer wants to check out, and you have to wait for a response from this third-party app before you can continue. Now, suddenly, the Shopify engineers have this source of potential problems and latency that they can't control. Uh, these third-party apps wouldn't necessarily be ready for a huge spike in traffic from some popular online store having a sale, for example. And that is exactly when you don't want your checkout process to stop working or something to be slow and introduce friction into the process. So you don't want to have a lot of third-party apps, potentially hundreds of third-party apps, causing problems for your customers' experience, for the reliability and speed that those customers are experiencing in their uh, use of your app. So what do we do here? And what did the Shopify developers do? 
So they decided that they wanted to have, for some situations, the ability to run third-party code themselves. Right? The third-party app developers could build the logic that they want to integrate into part of the Shopify product in part of the critical flow, where Shopify would host and run those functions itself. That way, they can scale it up to meet demand as much as they want. Uh, they can make sure that they are fast enough, that there isn't some kind of network problem connecting to the other servers, that there isn't a maintenance period. Um, they have full control over, over running this third-party code, and they can have a lot more confidence integrating that into the Shopify app in a way that could potentially slow down a customer experience. So, as a spoiler, they used WebAssembly for this. And shout out to the Shopify engineers uh, who have given talks about this, made blog posts about this. Highly recommend checking out. They give a, go into a lot more detail about how exactly they did this. Um, so we're going to step away from that for a little bit and talk about, generally, why do we not want to do this? Why do we not want to run untrusted code? Because if you see this, you should be, uh, this should be your face. Uh, this is really scary. If someone has uh, code that they've just uploaded to your website and you haven't carefully reviewed it yourself, it's not from some well-trusted source, then a lot of things could potentially go wrong. If you were to just say, run this untrusted code as part of your web server or part of some process that has access to anything, then that code could potentially access the keys that it has in memory, the environment variables. Uh, it could access, if it has permission to talk to a database, maybe this untrusted code could talk to that database as well. Uh, typically, a single process running on, mach on a machine is all of the, that the kernel will see, all of the operating system will see. That process has permission to do something, so whatever that process is executing has permission to do that thing as well, to read the memory or to access parts of the operating system. So this is pretty scary, right? The idea of running untrusted code. But there are a lot of people out there running untrusted code, so how do they do it? What are the options that we should consider in this kind of situation? So I'm going to go through a couple of different uh, tools that are out there uh, that are all available to be used. Uh, as each one is a kind of representative of a particular approach that you could take. So the first one I want to focus in on is Firecracker. This is a micro VM manager. Uh, this was developed by AWS for Lambda and Fargate. This is what your Lambdas are running in. Uh, it is a tiny, tiny virtual machine. It's the lightest, lightweight, most lightweight possible virtual machine they could build, I think. Uh, it uses KVM, the kernel virtual manager, uh, or virtual machine. Uh, and it has, essentially, you get to run a little sandbox. It has its own kernel, its own operating system. Um, you have to run this on a bare metal machine because it relies on hardware level virtualization. Right? You cannot run this in a virtual machine, so you have to have actual physical machines or pay for bare metal machines on your cloud provider. So it is a bit more of a, an investment to set up. Uh, but this is basically this, the gold standard of security. Right? You have a separate VM and a separate kernel uh, for each bit of untrusted code that you're running. Uh, and it's not just Firecracker. Uh, there's a bunch of other tools for this, like QMU and Carter containers uh, to look into. At a different level, we have Docker. And I'm using Docker here as a representative for sort of all Linux containers, all process containers. They're sharing the same kernel. They're sharing the same operating system, but relying on tools in that operating system that isolate processes and give them very, very limited permissions. Right, limiting the memory, limiting the CPU, limiting what system calls it can make. Now, I wouldn't necessarily recommend using straight up containers uh, for sandboxing unless you really know what you're doing, uh, but they, uh, it is one of the tools in the toolbox to possibly use for this. You can run it in a virtual machine. You don't need that hardware level virtualization. Um, if you are using Docker specifically, like be very careful with the Docker daemon and what has access to the daemon because the daemon itself is very powerful. Um, but yeah, this will sandbox containers. It will limit their memory uh, and it will limit what they can do. And if you're running stuff on your own machine, it might be a good idea to run untrusted code in a Docker container because that will help you at least get some level of security. Now, if you're not sure about this whole sharing the kernel and making syscalls thing because it is vulnerable to say a bug in the kernel where some kind of malformed system call could get out of the sandbox, uh, there is another layer uh, called GVisor, 
uh, which was built by Google. This was originally built for Cloud Run and Cloud Functions. They don't really use that anymore. They have a virtual machine-based version now. Um, but this is a, a tool, uh, open source tool that you can use. Uh, and it's an extra isolation layer on top of containers, right? It, it sort of is a little bit of a proxy between the container and the operating system uh, to make sure that it is only making the syscalls that uh, you want it to make and that it is talking to the kernel for you. So there's less attack surface that can actually uh, exploit a vulnerability in the kernel. So an extra layer on top of that. But then we take a step back and we look at all of these things, we think, okay, how expensive is this to run, right? How much work do I need to go to to set this up? And if I was going to run a lot of small bits of code, what is that gonna be like? So if you look at the websites for all of these different products, they have um, vastly different startup times that they quote. Uh, so it took me a while to find someone that had actually like benchmarked these in a consistent way across all of them. Uh, so this paper uh, benchmarked not just the startup time, but how much memory they use and everything. Um, and for each one of these, it kind of has a startup time of around a second uh, at least to start up one of these. If you wanted to say, have a lot of them that you start up, they run for a very short amount of time and then they stop, it would actually be quite a lot of overhead to be continually starting and stopping these. Uh, you can make this faster if you have a bunch of them ready to go. Uh, and so you don't have to pay the full startup time every, one, every time you want to run something. Um, and if you cut down the features that you use, you can get the startup time smaller than this. But at the absolute minimum, you're still talking in the sort of 100, of mil 100 millisecond range. Now, 100 milliseconds isn't much, but it's a lot to add to the request, to the latency of a request if you're trying to do something that's really fast and really light. Um, this is perfectly good if you're wanting to run a virtual machine on the cloud uh, or you're running, wanting to run a long-lived process like a web server. You don't care that it takes just a second to start up. Uh, but if we're talking about small amounts of code, the startup time uh, comes into it. On top of that, running a virtual machine takes a bunch of memory. Uh, running containers is a lot of processes. If you have a lot of them and you have problems with context switching between processes, there's a lot of extra overhead to running virtual machines and to running separate processes. If we could run untrusted code in the same process as our actual, where something that has permissions. If we could safely run untrusted code within a process, then we could do this much, much cheaper. And someone has done this. Uh, Cloudflare uses V8 isolates to run many, many uh, edge workers in the same process. And this gives them a five millisecond startup time. So V8 is the JavaScript engine underlying Chrome. And V8 isolates are a feature of V8 that lets, that lets you run separate JavaScript engine contexts, uh, which in theory, the JavaScript inside that isolate cannot access things outside unless you allow it to do so. So Cloudflare has been doing this for a surprisingly long time. Um, they have caught some criticism for this as to whether it's secure, but they've done a lot of work uh, to make it uh, as secure as they can. Uh, but they're able to run a lot of tiny web servers very, very cheaply in the same process with a very short startup time. So this is not really a fair comparison, okay? We're comparing like a whole virtual machine to an isolated JavaScript engine instance, okay? And it's not meant to be a fair comparison. We're looking at different options and we're trying to consider the trade-offs between them. If we wanted to be able to run any kind of code and run any kind of process or have multiple processes we need something like a virtual machine or a container, right, to be able to run anything. If we're okay with the idea that we're just running tiny bits of JavaScript and they don't have to be able to do very much, then maybe we can consider a different option that's lighter weight. So there's a trade-off between what you can do uh, and what you want the code to be able to do and what kind of sandboxing level you want to have. Okay. So let's come back to WebAssembly. Where does WebAssembly fit in in this kind of spectrum of trade-offs? Uh, to start off with, we'll go into a bit more about what, assembly, what WebAssembly actually is, because it's often the thing that we've heard of, or we kind of know what it is, but we don't necessarily know how it works on the inside and what it can and can't do. So, WebAssembly was originally built for web browsers, okay? A way to run other kinds of code other than JavaScript in a web browser. A way to run efficient sort of computational uh, code 
in a web browser, something that JavaScript is not super good at dealing with things at like the byte level. Essentially, it was built for this kind of app. This is uh, the web version of Adobe Photoshop, and it uses WebAssembly for a bunch of its image processing and its sort of underlying stuff. They were able to take some of the code that they already had in C++ from the Photoshop desktop app and compile it to WebAssembly to make a really fully featured uh, web app version of it that can do a lot of the processing locally in the browser without having to like go to the server or incur latency. So this is the kind of situation that WebAssembly was originally built for. Essentially, making web browsers more powerful and able to do things other than just run JavaScript. So it's a compile target. So it's not a language that you would ever write by hand. You would write some code in Rust or Go or C or C++ and compile that into a WebAssembly binary file that then your browser would know how to run. Uh, so let's dive into a bit of an example. Uh, this is not Rust or C. Uh, it looks a lot like TypeScript, but TypeScript doesn't really have a 32-bit integer type. Uh, this is assembly script. It's a purpose-built language that was built in order to compile into WebAssembly so that TypeScript developers wouldn't have to learn C so that they could make use of WebAssembly. Uh, it makes a really good example because a lot more people know TypeScript than, uh, than they know Rust or, or C. So here's a little example. We have a function. It has two 32-bit integers. It adds them together, and it returns another 32-bit integer. And if we compile this uh, in, oh, sorry. Yes, this is assembly script. If we compile this into WebAssembly, we get this. Now, this is the text format for WebAssembly. There's also a much more efficient binary format. But for debugging purposes, it's useful to have a text representation. And we can see here that we've got essentially a function uh, that has, takes two 32-bit integers and adds them together uh, and returns the result. So we have this WebAssembly binary file, and we can use this WebAssembly binary file in the same process from some other language. So this is JavaScript this time, not assembly script. I know they get confusing. Um, where we're reading a WebAssembly binary file, compiling it into a module. Uh, and then when we instantiate that module, it passes out this, these exports, and these are the functions, the exported function from here, that we can access and call just like any other function. Okay? So we have this like, little WebAssembly binary, and it exports a function. We can call that function from the outside, from some other context. Think of WebAssembly like a tiny simulated computer has its own call stack and instructions. It has like a byte array for its own memory. And it does not have any access to the outside world unless you explicitly provide it. The code in that the WebAssembly instructions are built so that they cannot access any memory outside of the byte array of its own memory. So it like can't access the memory or any of your JavaScript variables or whatever other language you're using to invoke the WebAssembly. Uh, and it can't really do anything else either. It can't read and write files, can't use the network, can't spawn processes or interact with other processes. It can't generate random numbers, it can't get the current time. Right? It can't do all of the things that native code or a fully featured language might be able to do. Um, it really wasn't designed to do that. What can WebAssembly do is a much shorter list. It can calculate things, right? It is like a computer. Uh, and it can call functions that were imported uh, if you give it functions to, to call, right? So it can call functions on the outside, but only if you give it functions that it can call. Otherwise, it is just calculating things and cannot do anything else. Now, this sounds pretty great, okay? We have a sandbox here, right? It was specific, specifically designed to be a sandbox to calculate things, to execute code, and not be able to do anything outside of that little box but you can run it in the same process as the rest of your code, uh, which is pretty cool. Sounds easy, right? It gets a little bit more complicated. Uh, so we're going to try using it in an example. Now I built this example uh, just for this talk. Uh, so it is a little rough around the edges. But this is a rock, paper, scissors tournament uh, where anybody can go to this website, upload a bit of code, and that code is their rock, paper, scissors bot. Uh, and then it matches all of the bots against each other. 
So for example, we might have at the top left, exemplary bot that chose paper every single time. It probably always chooses paper. Uh, and a random bot that chooses a random different thing each time. Uh, and in this case, the random bot uh, won and went on to the next round. Uh, and this is just a fun little example uh, because I wanted to build a site where people could upload code. And I wanted it to be easy enough that you could probably make a bot even within this talk. So we'll see whose bots are winning by the end of the talk. But I'll show you how to upload a bot later on. This is our example. So, okay, we need some kind of way for any developer to come in. We want them to be able to use any language to develop a WebAssembly bot uh, and then upload it to our site so that we can integrate it into the tournament. So a simplest way to do this would be, okay, well, we get everybody to create a function, uh, a rock, paper, scissors function that returns a string. Uh, and you can probably do more complicated things with this. We can maybe have some inputs where you have a bit more context about what bot you're facing. So you can do a little bit more strategy than just randomly picking rock, paper, or scissors. But to start off with, we'll do the simple version. Anyone can upload a function that returns rock or paper or scissors as a string. Now, if we compile this to WebAssembly, uh, we get this. Now, there's a reason that whenever you're looking at WebAssembly and trying to learn how WebAssembly works, the first example they give you is always a function that takes numbers and returns a number, right? It's usually a Fibonacci number generator or, a, or just something that adds two numbers together like the example I showed you before. And the reason for that is when you start dealing with more data than just a couple of integers, WebAssembly gets a bit interesting. Uh, if we look closely at the WebAssembly code that's been generated here, you can see that our rock, paper, scissors function actually returns an integer, not a string. Okay, it's returning the integer 1056. Why is it doing that? So this integer is not the string rock. It is in fact a pointer to where the string rock is in memory inside the WebAssembly engine. So this is rock, R-O-C-K, uh, encoded as a UTF-16 string. And the pointer is actually a little bit earlier to tell you that, okay, this is the start of the string. You read the integer, it tells you that there's eight bytes worth of string so that you know how much of the memory to read to then take that out and actually assemble it into a string uh, when you're using it. So this isn't usually a problem if you are writing your own WebAssembly and then using it from JavaScript on the web or on the server. Because when you generate this WebAssembly code, it also conveniently generates for you a wrapper library in JavaScript that will give you a nice interface for calling these functions. Okay, so this does, WebAssembly, you don't usually have to deal with like actually reading pointers and strings out of the WebAssembly memory when you're dealing with your own WebAssembly code. But that doesn't work very well for us making the scissors, scissors paper rock uh, tournament because we want people to just upload WebAssembly. We don't want to have to upload like a JavaScript wrapper library as well and then have to figure out how to sandbox the wrapper library too because we can't trust that either. So it gets a little complicated when we're trying to read data in and read data out of WebAssembly. Okay? Without the generated wrapper code, that can be kind of complicated. At the same time, we want our rock, paper, scissors bots to be able to use random numbers to maybe randomly choose which option that they want to do in certain circumstances. And there is no random number generator in WebAssembly because you don't have access to the current time in milliseconds either, so you don't really have any sources of entropy. It's entirely deterministic. So we want to be able to have random numbers for our rock, paper, scissors bots to work as well. Uh, so we want to use the WebAssembly system interface. So this is WASI. So not to be confused with WASM, which is short for WebAssembly. WASI is the WebAssembly system interface. It's kind of like an API on top of WebAssembly. Think of it like a set of import and export functions that let a WebAssembly app be treated a lot more like a regular process or a regular app uh, on, your, on your computer. So this is, again, assembly script, not JavaScript. Uh, and it's just a little program that prints some things to the standard output. And if we compile that into WebAssembly, we can run it kind of like another command line tool, right? I can run this WebAssembly, 
and it prints stuff to standard out. It can read from standard in, it can do a couple of things. I still have to run it in WASM time here, so I'm still running it in a WebAssembly engine, but I can treat it a lot like a normal process that can read the file system and access things. Uh, so how does that work? So when I compile this three-line assembly script program, I get 4,000 lines of WebAssembly, um, but ultimately, it is using the WASI import functions in order to be able to do things sort of outside of the process. So FD write is file descriptor write. So it is writing to the standard out file descriptor to be able to print things to the console. Uh, it has proc exit for like when it's finished to give to return a value. And it's able to get random numbers. Uh, these are all parts of, these are all specified as part of the WebAssembly system interface. And the, web, the WASI spec provides command line arguments, environment variables, the current clock time, uh, getting random numbers, accessing the file system. It can use, but it can't create sockets. Uh, this is preview one. There is also a preview two that's not finalized yet. But wasn't the whole point of using WebAssembly that WebAssembly couldn't do any of those things? Like, this is a sandbox. I don't want it to be able to access the file system or the environment variables of my host process. So Web, the WASI was actually kind of designed for this purpose specifically. So verbatim uh, from, the, uh, from the goals, the stated goals of the WASI project, is to define a set of portable, modular, runtime independent, and WebAssembly native APIs, which can be used by WebAssembly code to interact with the outside world. Okay, good. These APIs preserve the essential sandbox nature of WebAssembly through a capability-based API design. So yes, using WASI, the WebAssembly code can access the outside world, but only if you let it and only the parts of the outside world that you've specifically allowed it to access. So it gives an API for command line arguments, but you have to specify those command line arguments. It doesn't just automatically get the args of the host process. The environment variables, you have to specifically grant it access to specific environment variables or set your own fake environment variables when you're invoking the WebAssembly sandbox. It can access the clock time. You can always take that out. It can access random numbers. You can also disallow that. Uh, it can access the file system, but only the specific directories and files that you have granted it access to. It does not, by default, get any access to the file system. And it can only use sockets if you specifically give it a socket to use. So it is designed still for sandboxing, but the, uh, the parts that you want to allow, you can allow. Uh, and WASI is enough of a recognized standard that you can run, build and run WASM and WASI programs um, across all of these languages. So for C and C++, Rust, Go, and AssemblyScript, you can compile a program using the WASI API uh, and run it. For Python, Ruby, and PHP, the, the Interpreters themselves have written in C, I think all of them, maybe not all of them, um, but they have themselves been compiled into WebAssembly. So you can run a full Python interpreter uh, in, as a WASI program uh, in WebAssembly because C Python has been compiled into WebAssembly. Uh, there are JavaScript engines, uh, but not Node because V8 is very difficult to compile into WebAssembly. Uh, so you get quite a broad set of support for different languages. Uh, by depending on WASM and WASI. And for our particular uh, rock, paper, scissors tournament, we've I've chosen to use just standard in and standard out as our way of interacting between the bots. So anyone can upload a WebAssembly binary if it is compiled with the WASI API. And just printing to standard out, either the word rock, scissors, or paper, uh, to choose a particular move for a particular round. But there's also some input in here as well. So you can read uh, some JSON from the first line of standard input, uh, which will include the name of your opponent. And if there have been multiple rounds where you have had a draw in the previous round, it will include information about those rounds as well. So you can have a bot that kind of goes, well, I know this particular bot us usually chooses rock, so uh, I'm going to choose paper. And you can do better than random odds uh, for your bots. So let's have a look. Uh, if you want to play along, it is also an audience participation live demo. So you can go to this website if you want to. It should work on a phone, although the UI might not be great. 
uh, and you can upload a bot. But let's demonstrate that first. So this is the tournament. Uh, currently, there are, what is that, four, five, six bots. And once a minute, it will automatically trigger a new tournament. Uh, and so there's a certain amount of randomness. Uh, even a very clever bot not, might not win every time. But statistically, it should win more often than just the bot that always chooses paper. So if we go to the Create page, here we can upload a WebAssembly bot just by uploading a WASM file. So if I go to my editor, I have here an example assembly script bot. Uh, I'm going to change this to be like, hello, Yao Brisbane. And all right, we're going to do a show of hands. Who wants this bot to return rock? OK, paper. Yeah, a few more hands. Scissors. Wow, why is scissors? It was the same before. OK. All right. Melbourne also likes scissors, apparently. Um, so I have this bot, and I'm going to run yarn as build to compile it into WebAssembly. And then I have in here my release.wasm file, uh, which it has built. So if I go back here, I'm going to call this Brisbane bot. Select the WASM file. Sorry, the text is too tiny to see. And enter the tournament. And if I go up here to the tournament, uh, we might need to wait a little bit uh, because it will run once a minute. Uh, it's timed really well last time I gave this talk. We might have just missed one. If you want to make a more exciting bot, again, there is standard input there. Oh, wow, there's a couple of bots already. Uh, who did Paper McPaperson? Hey. Um, OK, Brisbane bot here. Uh, chose scissors. Unfortunately, that was not a good choice, and it got eliminated in the first round. Uh, but uh, we can also go here. If we have a look, if you don't want to have to build a WebAssembly file, uh, there is also the option of writing a Python script. and if we, we can use this a little bit to experiment with like what limitations there are on the WebAssembly bots. So if I want to say while true pass, maybe at the end I'll say print paper. Uh, this is essentially a busy loop in Python. Uh, what will happen uh, if I try to run this? So if I run the test button, uh, nothing happens. It says the program ran out of fuel. It reached the limit of a billion WebAssembly instructions. So each bot is limited to running a specific number of WebAssembly instructions. If it reaches that limit, the bot is just done. Okay. And it will not be included in future tournaments. Uh, so you can avoid having you know, just a, a loop running right, by the number of instructions. Someone in Melbourne found uh, that they could import time and say time.sleep for a really long time. Uh, so you do also, and this will not have very many instructions because that's just one instruction, really. Uh, so if I run this, uh, it is now also timing out uh, if it was waiting too long asynchronously. Uh, you can try and use too much memory. You can try and write gigabytes of information into standard out. Um, and all of those things should be limited. Uh, if you find something that I have not been limiting or sandboxing correctly, then please let me know. Uh, but this is a reasonably safe way for this kind of uh, situation uh, to run code, way that I can limit the memory, can limit how much CPU it's using, um, and I can uh, limit access to things. So it has in-memory streams for standard in and standard out and standard error. It's not reading and writing those to the file system. And I have limited how big those streams are, so there's a limit to how much you can write to them has a limited amount of fuel and how many instructions it can run, has a limited time, has a limited amount of memory it can, and can allocate. And most of the, the uploaded uh, WebAssembly file bots have no file system access, but the way that the Python bot wor works is I'm running the Python interpreter and giving it access to a temporary directory with the Python file that it can run. It is a read-only temporary directory. Uh, so yes, the Python bots have very limited file system access, um, but they can read a single file and write nothing. So are people actually doing this in the real world? So we looked at Shopify, 
Uh, so let's see how Shopify functions work. So if you go to the Shopify docs, you can see the current in, uh, the details about how to build and upload and run a Shopify function as part of a third party app. So like the scissors, paper, rock tournaments, this was not an entirely contrived example. Uh, for Shopify functions, you can upload a WASI binary, a uh, WASI WebAssembly binary, and specify a GraphQL query against the regular Shopify API. That GraphQL query is executed before the function is run, and it is passed as JSON input to standard in to the WebAssembly function. So you can get data from the data that, that you need before the uh, WebAssembly is run. And depending on uh, what, in what situation this function was invoked, in what part of the flow in, in which uh, Shopify situation it was invoked, it will then produce uh, output in another JSON format to indicate what the result of that function is and what should be done for that action. Uh, in, the, in the rock, paper, scissors bots, uh, only the last line of standard out matters, but for the Shopify functions, uh, the whole standard out is interpreted as JSON, so any other logging has to go to standard error. Um, but aside from that, yeah, you can upload a WebAssembly file as part of a function on Shopify. Now, these are pretty limited. The, the size of the WebAssembly is limited. The runtime is limited. It has no access to the clock. It has no access to random numbers. Um, it isn't meant to be entirely deterministic based on the input. Um, and it has a very limited amount of runtime. So these are intended for very small, but sometimes complicated logic decisions that need to be uh, integrated into Shopify as part of their flow. So that's one example. As a completely different example, there are other situations where you might want to think about sandboxing code in the same process. And Firefox have written a really awesome uh, article about how they use this. So uh, Nathan Freud, a Mozilla engineer, uh, wrote that Google, Microsoft, and Mozilla have each independently found that around 70% of security bugs in their browsers were memory safety bugs. So these browsers are mostly written in C++. And a single buffer overflow or some kind of memory safety issue uh, can mean that the process for a, web s for a page can be exploited by potentially some, some asset that it's loading. And Mozilla found that they had a bunch of libraries that they were using that were written in C++ that they mostly, they trusted the code. They knew it wasn't written maliciously, but if a memory safety issue was in one of those libraries, that exploit could compromise the whole browser. So for the graph, graphite font shaping library, so this is a library used for rendering fonts, uh, they did not want to have to go through all of the code and audit it just for this one library. Uh, to make sure that it didn't have any memory safety issues, but also they might not have found all of them anyway. Um, but if someone had loaded a malicious font file, that could potentially exploit a memory safety issue and compromise a website. So they took this potentially unsafe uh, C++ code, they compiled it to WebAssembly, and then they compiled that WebAssembly to native code. So a WebAssembly engine will JIT compile into native code, and you might as well ahead of time compile that. The process is slightly different. It took some work. Um, but then they were able to just use that native code um, as part of the browser. This tiny library was not worth running a whole separate process for to sandbox it away from the rest of the rendering of a web page, but they were able to sandbox it with a small performance hit in the same process as the main thread. Uh, and so uh, they don't have to include the entire WebAssembly engine as part of their build because they were able to compile it to native code and just call into it. So recommend reading that article as well if that's something that you're interested in. It kind of explores the use of WebAssembly to sandbox even just a library that we're using that we don't entirely trust. If something goes wrong in that library, we don't want it to infect the rest of the process. If we have, say, log4j, and if we were running that in a sandbox, maybe it wouldn't be so bad that we find one day this library has a security vulnerability in it, because that can happen to pretty much any library. So when we're talking about the sandbox that WebAssembly is, how secure are we really talking? Now, this is hard to say, right? You can't really put a number on, like, this is 10 out of 10 secure. Um, it doesn't make sense. Uh, there will always be bugs and exploits, but uh, what we're, when we're talking about is WebAssembly secure and is WASI secure, uh, it does matter a lot 
which particular implementation we're talking about, because uh, not all WebAssembly or WASI implementations were created with security in mind. Uh, as an example, Node.js has an experimental WASI interface, right? So you can execute WASI programs uh, in Node.js, but you should not use this for sandboxing. Like the, document, the documentation explicitly says, uh, do not rely on this to run untrusted code. Uh, the file system sandboxing is not implemented fully to the level of security that is intended for WASI. Uh, so you might grant it access to one part of the file system, but it might be able to access other parts of the file system. So, but the one that I use, and that seems to be the one that the, uh, most of the other examples I've given uh, are using this one as well. Uh, this is WASM time. It's built by the Bytecode Alliance, which is a not-for-profit. And uh, it's written in Rust. It was, in, it was built, purpose-built, for sandboxing WebAssembly code and for implementing WASI in a secure way for sandboxing. So it was built in Rust so that they would get as much memory safety as they can while still working efficiently. Uh, they're very careful with their use of unsafe blocks in Rust. They audit and review all the dependencies. They perform 24-7 like fuzz testing, uh, like putting random data in and checking that the, uh, the system still works correctly. Uh, and I recommend reading the articles about how they do mitigation of Spectre. So I haven't really talked about Spectre because it wouldn't fit into the talk, but uh, Spectre is a concern when you're running any kind of untrusted code on the same machine as any secrets that you care about. Um, processes give you one level of isolation. Virtual machines give you another level of isolation. Running things in the same process is a bit riskier and so there are other things that you need to think about uh, in regards to Spectre. Uh, and as always, you should have more than one layer of security. If you're running untrusted code, even in a WebAssembly sandbox, uh, you should not at, run it on the same machine as anything that you care about, if at all possible, right? It is not, uh, you should as much as possible still keep that away from any other things that you care about. You should have ways of uh, detecting uh, potential attacking bots or malicious bots and uh, quarantining them away from the other bots, things like that. There are other things that you can do to add extra layers of security around the WebAssembly sandbox. Um, there have been, like any, like any security sandbox, uh, there have been reported issues that have since been fixed, but there may be other vulnerabilities where someone could break out of the sandbox. So it is always a possibility that you need to keep in mind uh, when using any kind of sandbox. Okay. So this is all relatively new bleeding edge stuff. Like what, what state is this currently in and can I use this in my production environment? So firstly, WebAssembly, absolutely go ahead and use it. Uh, this is, which version of Windows was this? I think it's like Windows 2000 um, or is it Windows 95? I don't know, who recognizes these things? Huh? 98, Windows, okay, Windows 98. Um, this is my own artwork, by the way. Uh, this is running in the browser. So this is not Windows compiled to WebAssembly. This is an, an, an implementation of x86, a little x86 virtual machine running in WebAssembly in the browser, and it just happens to have loaded Windows on top of that. Uh, so you can actually go to this website uh, and play Mind, Minesweeper if you want to and feel, feel the nostalgia. Uh, WebAssembly can do powerful things. If you're running WebAssembly, if you want to run uh, cool things in the browser, WebAssembly is absolutely a great option. Um, WebAssembly itself is pretty solid. Uh, it's supported across all the major browsers and including the phone browsers. Uh, WASI is probably the more bleeding edge part of what I'm talking about. Uh, WASI, the specification is still in preview uh, and the WASM time API is kind of changing the support across different languages uh, is pretty variable, uh, but you can still use it, and people are using it. Uh, it just doesn't have like all of the developer experience stuff that you would expect from a more mature system. Uh, so it is still ready to use, but expect to have a little bit of pain. Um, the tooling and language support is getting a lot better day by day. There's, there's a lot of energy around this and a lot of people working on it. Um, the WebAssembly component model spec uh, is making uh, having, instead of using WASM, instead of using WASI as your interface and using standard in and standard out, the ability to make a function that has a particular interface that would work across languages, uh, that is getting better. 
uh, using the interfaces part of the WebAssembly component model. So if you would like to just have a function to call rather than a little tiny program that you run, uh, then check that out. Uh, also, Docker is adding support for WebAssembly and WASI containers. Uh, if you go to your Docker desktop and like enable the beta setting, uh, you'll be able to run WASM workloads in Docker as well. So that is another option to check out. Okay. Um, I wanted to mostly finish up with this quote from the Fastly website. Bear in mind, this is marketing materials, um, but I like how snarky it is. With WASM time, we have achieved very fast instance instantiation times, typically within a few microseconds, not milliseconds. Fastly is therefore able to provide a significantly faster code execution startup time than any other serverless solution, freeing developers to focus on application development. Um, that sounds pretty good. I feel like it's throwing shade. Um, but yeah, there is, this is a tool that is out there. It is used for sandboxing in the real world by real world cloud hosting providers. Uh, and I want you to think about when you are running code that you don't entirely trust. Uh, is it libraries that you're linking into your product uh, where maybe that library could have a vulnerability in it that could cause problems? Are you running code locally on your machine that might be able to do things that you don't want it to be able to do, uh, where you haven't checked the sources of where that code is coming from? Okay, This is not just putting up a sign and saying, upload your untrusted code here. There's lots of situations where we have somewhat trusted and probably okay, but could potentially ruin everything, uh, untrusted code that we run every day. And if we could have a collection of sandboxed libraries that we plug together, where one library can only really interact with the software through its own interface and can't access all of the memory of the process, uh, we would potentially have a much safer ecosystem of libraries that we could work with and something like a supply chain attack wouldn't be as scary. So I'm hopeful, hopeful in the future uh, that we will end up with more secure software than we have now, uh, but it is still early days and WebAssembly is really only being used for the situations where security is incredibly vital, like in a web browser uh, or running a hosting environment. So how are those uh, rock, paper, scissors bots doing? If we go back and have a look, if we go to the tournament. Oh, yeah, there's a couple more bots here. I need to zoom out. Oh, yep, the tournament's going. It's pretty fast. Yep, it takes a little bit longer when it's running like 10 version, 10 instances of the bot. Bear in mind, most of these bots are Python, so it is actually running an entire Python interpreter every single time you see one of these little paper symbols. Okay, Jacob. Jacob won the tournament. Oops. Yes. <laughs> well done. <laughs> nice one. Okay. Um, please go check out the code for Snippy. Uh, please try to hack it. Let me know if you find any vulnerabilities. Uh, I would love to hear about that. There's no like private data on there except the code and bot names that people have uploaded. So. Cool. Thank you very much. <laughs>